Welcome everyone to the table, the podcast here. I am joined with Pastor Lynn Shaw and Pastor Andy, and we are here talking about Lent. We are going into week number five of Lent, there you go. which is Can pretty you exciting. It? I can't believe that means we are just a couple weeks out from Easter. Yeah. Wow. Um, one of the things that I think about is um, Lent is one of those times of reflection, times of stepping away. We talk about the desert. No one likes to talk about the desert, but we're kind of in the desert right now. And I don't know about y'all, but we I'm, live in one. We do live in southern Idaho, high desert, high right? mountain Come desert. Come on, yeah. Ooh. But and I, I guess I do love the desert. Look at that. <laughs> We digress, but we are um, looking forward to Easter, but we're still in Lent, and Lent is an important right. season that we're getting to step back and reflect and do some things in our life, and so Pastor Lynn has been walking us through a series or a movement, if you will, uh, and I'll just recap real fast. The first Sunday of Lent, we talked about going into the desert, mm -hmm. uh, creating a time or a space to go into the desert to remove some things from our life. Uh, we talked about past all obstacles, that once you dedicate your heart to Christ and you go into the desert and you spend time with him, uh, the enemy is going to come and he's going to tempt you. He's mm -hmm. going to challenge your identity. There's some things that are going to happen in your life. Uh, we talked about getting off the fence. Don't be hot or cold. You need to be either hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm. Right. right? And then we talked uh, recently, this is what we're going to jump in today, but about going down the road. Getting down the road was the... Mm -hmm the conversation that you had. So we're roads jump into lead, that. lead places and roads is, do lead places. Yeah. Um, and so any road of life, it, the, the idea that I had about going down the road, um, it just was the best thing that I could pick, but, but a road would be a way of living Yeah, and how we live, you know, choices that we make, over and over again, take us places. Yeah. And, um, you know, it could be where we want to go yeah, or where we really don't want to go. Well, I, I read a book recently, and one of the points of the book is that we're all being formed. Yeah. Every single one of us are being formed. and, and All he, the time we're being formed. All the time yeah. we're being formed. And one of the examples that he used was the idea that we're all on paths and we're all going somewhere. And uh, the ultimate goal is to become like Jesus, right? right? That's the path that we want to be on. But Lent is one of those reflective times where we could ask the question, am I on the path that leads to reflecting Christ? Mm -hmm. Am I on the path to being formed into the image of our creator? Yeah, and is how I'm living getting me closer to God and being conformed to his image and likeness? Or yeah, am I just getting older? It, yeah, is it just leading us somewhere? You We're know. going somewhere, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, on the text that you use, Pastor Lynn, is the, the parable of the prodigal son. And so this is, I guess, a recap, if you will, would be that the son comes and asks for an, his inheritance. And you stopped there, which I think is a, a really uh, great way to look at it, Pastor Lynn. Most people that read that passage of Scripture, they it, it's just kind of a, he asks for his inheritance and his dad gives it to him and see you later. Yeah. But that's a huge deal. Yeah. And more than just coming and asking your, your parents for their inheritance, for your inheritance, this is a, I'm leaving my family. Right. Uh, and there's, a, there's a, a given that's in that that a lot of people I don't think even think about. But this is a bigger deal than just asking for our inheritance. This is, a big, this is the deal that says, hey, I'm going to be dead to my family now. Yeah, I'm going to be cut off. It's a it's a deal that I don't know that we in our American culture even I don't I don't know if there's anything that even comes close to that yeah um, you know of of wanting something significant mm -hmm. your inheritance is significant before the parents dies and then but to get it um, you have to leave the family mm -hmm. and that's I I just think that's something for us that you know there's just really nothing that that we live by, you know, culturally that yeah. gets that. But I think it makes the story much, much, you know, have a deeper impact in the, in the dad, you know, when the, when the prodigal son gets back, um, the dad, you know, lays that out. He says he was dead. He was dead to me. Yeah. And now he's alive. And now he's alive, which is really powerful. I had, I had read a book a long time ago from a missionary that was giving an example of how different cultures read scripture 
and he pointed this story out from a perspective that most Americans zoom in on inheritance <laughs> because we're money minded. We think about all of that, <clears throat> but most cultures of the world they they, they don't look at the inheritance side as much as they look at the fact that he had walked away from his family, right. that he had walked away from, um, a lot more than just money. And so sure. that's an emphasis that I appreciate that you, you put on that. So, um, <clears throat> but this idea of a road and I'll just, I guess, recap still, right? He walks away from his inheritance. He disowns himself from his family. Um, he goes and he very quick summary is he plunders all of his money on prostitutes and on all kinds of stuff that would be ungodly. Uh, and then he comes to himself and he realizes... I love that phrase. It's a great and phrase. And when he came to himself. And I want like, to talk wow. about that a, a lot later because yeah. you, you made some great em- emphasis on that, Pastor <laughs> Lynn, that we'll definitely talk about. So he, he comes to himself, he realizes where he was wrong, and he comes to a place of repentance, if you will, right? And he comes home, his father sees him from afar off, welcomes him back in, kills the fatted calf. This is a very quick summary, right? Uh, and then the older brother comes into play. And throws and a fit. Jealousy, <laughs> throws a fit. Big problem. You've been away. I've been the perfect son, blah, blah, blah. So here's the story now. And um, you, you create a picture, Pastor Lynn, of going down the road, okay? Right. And one of the statements that you've made many times in my life that I love um, from Dean Yates is that sin will take you places you never thought you'd go. Mm-hmm make you do things you never thought you would do and will keep you there way longer than you ever thought you'd be there. And, and maybe there's a difference. And it'll cost you more than you thought you'd ever pay. Cost you more than you thought you'd ever pay. And I think that's a really great point that um, this idea of going down a road, right? Um, we're, we're going down a road somewhere. And if we're not paying attention, we're, we could very easily, I think this is a part that for any parable, it's good to put yourself in the positions of every single angle. Mm-hmm. So to look from the kid, the parable son, to look to the father, to look from the angle of the, the older brother, right? But to, to recognize I could be that prodigal son. Right. I could very easily put myself in that spot. And so maybe just talk about that for just a moment. We're in the season of Lent. How can this season of Lent help us to reflect the road that we're on? Yeah, I, I think part of it just comes down to something that's really not revelatory. It's not deep. It's just, it's just I think, Lent can create the space if we let it or if we force it to to just be quiet and listen and observe. You know, how many times have we driven by, my wife and I drove by something in, ah, just recently, I can't remember where it was even, um, but it was local, you know, where I live. But I had driven by there so many times and I saw something for the first time. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe the reason I saw it, because I wasn't driving. I wasn't focused on something else. So I'm just sitting, she's driving, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Where did that come from? She goes, well, that's been there for a month. And I'm like, no way. She says, yeah. And it's like, I think that can be us doing life. And Lent can just be sitting in the passenger seat. Mm. We're not concentrating on the same things the same way. And we can, we, can, we can hear and we can see and sense some things that maybe, that's why I don't, I, I, you know, I, if you were to put blinders on when you're driving down some highways, un- unless you saw the signage, you wouldn't know where you are. But it's beautiful. It's nice trees and nice, well, nice maybe the panorama is nice. But I think Lent just creates the time that says, man, hmm, this road that I'm on, this way of living, wow, how is it? And is it getting me to where I want to go? And I think sometimes we even go, where am I going? I don't know how many times. You know, I, I live south of Filer. And I don't know how many times this happens to me yearly. Is I'll come into town and want to be, let's say, go visit somebody in the hospital. From, from where I live, I have, to, I have to turn at a different spot. I don't know how many times I'll be going along and just not even thinking. That's the story of my life. Maybe get on the phone and I'm talking to somebody and I realize, junk, 
I'm in twin now. I have to turn around and go around and get back out, you know, yep. over there by Twin Falls Reformed Church and go to the hospital or something. And I just think, I just think that Lent is a wonderful time that we can purposefully say, I'm going to really pay attention now and watch our surroundings and watch how we're living and, and, and then make assessments. God is this, you know, because we, we increase our prayer life, right? God is this. Is this good for me? And what can I do? Where am I headed? And I, I just think it's a great time to pay attention to where we are on the road. That's a great word picture, Pastor Lynn. How many times have we just been driving somewhere and talking and pay, not paying attention and we end up somewhere else? <laughs> yeah. And how many times have us as pastors sat with people and, and maybe even had those cry on our couch, if you will, of, gosh, I'm in my midlife crisis now because I just didn't pay attention. Right. And here's a great example, I think, in Lent that says, hey, we can, we can open our eyes and pay attention. And, um, man, there's a, we could stay there for a long time because then even the grace of God later on in our life, he's waiting for us to come back, and we'll jump sure. into that in a minute. Yeah. But um, this, this idea um, that I would say even verse number 17, and it, it's where you already quoted, but it starts out by saying, uh, then he came to himself. And one of the movements that we've been talking about from day one of Lent is the idea of identity, that your identity will constantly be challenged and your identity will constantly be uh, come against, right? And when he came to himself, and I, I was thinking about this, T.D. Jakes, back in the day, we were at a conference that he talked about how you can have, in a scenario, the perfect father in a perfect scenario, the garden, with perfect children, if you will, Adam and Eve, and they still failed. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something to maybe even stop on for just a moment, that this idea that um, God's perfect kids still messed up. And I don't know, I, I just wanted to bring that up for a minute. I'm, I'm sure all of us as pastors have had those well, conversations. Well, Andy thinks he's the perfect kid. <laughs> well, there so it is. So we'll let Andy address this. <laughs> Who's the older older brother in this scenario? Wow. Well, I guess I'm the older. Okay. <laughs> but there, Ooh, I don't want to be the older brother. <laughs> None of us want to be the older brother, but we all are somewhere in this story, right? Do we really want to open up that box? <laughs> Go a lot of different directions. Yeah. Well, and I, so there, there's a promise in God's word. Raise your children in the way of the Lord. Yeah. When they grow, they will not depart. Yeah. And yeah. we see in this scenario, sometimes they depart, but they, they won't depart. I actually maybe, referenced that. Maybe talk about that for to, a minute, I'm Pastor to find Andy. Where it was. I'll have to look for that a little bit later. But there, you know, I think time, we talk about time, we talk about Lent and you know, creating that time where you know, God can begin working in our hearts and lives and gives us a sense of what his purpose is for us. There's a, there's a phrase that I was writing down that I just thought of and that speaks to me in this, and you'll love this. It's, remember, J.G. Wentworth? And yeah, they, would, Wentworth. they would say, the prodigal son would be an excellent spokesperson for J.G. Wentworth. He'd say, <laughs> Dad, I want my money, and, and I, want I, want now. Now. I want it now. And yeah. so everyone starts <laughs> joining in for the, in that because they want what they want, and they want it now. That is the craziest commercial. It is. By the way. It's, it's, Every time I, love I that. see that commercial, I go, what's up with that? <laughs> it's, Anyhow, go it's ahead. It's, a great, from it's a great logo for kids who say to their parents, I want my allowance. I want it now. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether I've done it, that's another story. <laughs> but uh, it's really interesting that he, he talks to his dad and says, this is what I want. He has a clear cut pl plan of how he wants to receive his stuff. And then right off in the next couple of verses, you find there that, you know, not many days yet later. So it takes dad a while to gather the stuff to give to son. So he has to liquidate the estate for his son's satisfaction. It makes me think, you know, when we talk about time in Lent, considering how God is working on my behalf, what am I doing on behalf of my relationship with the Lord? What happens in my mind as I've said those dumb things, mm. as I've done those dumb things, to cause me to contemplate, now, how's God responding out of his faithfulness, out of his grace towards me, and why am I doing this? Why am I behaving like this? It really caused me then to in turn focus on how God is so good, how I am oftentimes so stupid. But yet, mm. in the case of the prodigal son, he does not get a place where however many days it was, whether it be a week, whether it be a couple months, however long it takes for dad to liquidate stuff on his behalf, nowhere does the son ever change his point of view. Nowhere does anyone come back to him and say, hey, have you really thought about what you're about to do? Mm. He's firmly committed that I'm going to go on this road of stupidity because I'm choice. committed to doing this. I don't care where it goes. I don't care how long it's going to take me. I don't care what I'm going to spend because I'm getting a lot of money out of this good deal. 
yeah. and he's really focused on that. And, and it brings me back to that other biblical principle that you brought up, train up a child. So you'd like to think that somewhere along the way, mom and dad were training up this child in the way he should go. The point in time when he realized, oh no, the path I've chose is the wrong one. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he's not going to depart from it. It takes some time. How long is that time? Right. It takes a while, but nonetheless, the principles of God stand sure. And the young man comes to a place where he finds himself asking as he's looking at the food for the, for the pigs. It's like, wow, mom and dad have so much better, and even their servants mm-hmm. have bread to spare. What have I done? And I think when we, we, when we part and talk about like mm-hmm. Lent or preparing our hearts before the Lord, what God has been doing in his faithfulness versus what I've been doing in my unfaithfulness, what are those trigger points in our lives that cause us to re- recollect, I failed? Mm-hmm. And I think even when we, we've talked about maybe putting off caffeine, maybe putting off certain sugary foods, maybe thinking about way, what we say before we do it, that cause us, well, how would Jesus want me to respond in a situation like mm-hmm. this? What are the principles of God's word that undergird me yeah. in a case such I, as this? Yeah, you, you said something. I don't know that, I don't know that, I don't know when he said, <clears throat> you know, I want this stuff, Dad, you know, sort of essentially. I think he probably, I, I don't think, I don't think it was said with this idea, I want this stuff, and boy, I want to go just blow it. Sure. I, I think there was a side of him that thought he was really going to just go with the world. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, I, you know, there's just, there's a lot of lessons to be learned in it that yeah. you don't know what you don't know until you realize you didn't know it. Mm. I really like, you know, you, you, you say that, and I want to jump on that for a moment because, you know, the Bible talks about he, he lived riotous living, you know, right. whatever word you want to define from whatever version yeah. you happen to use. Sure. It's like we, we think about the riotous living and respect, and you even brought that up earlier. His brother said, so his brother must be authority in his, what his behavior was. So he was living with harlots. He was spending all his money on all these deviant kinds of behavior. And yet within the text itself, the Bible says he went off to a far country. So how in the world does his brother, who never left, know what he's done what he in really his departure, did. what he really did? He's reading yeah. into it. Sure. So he's reading into that. And so but that's th- how big brothers are. Th- I had one. That's true. <laughs> they may be. I, I didn't, so I'm at, I'm at a deficit. But, you know, the, the terminology that the Bible uses, you know, so he's a, he, he lived riotously. We think about the term riotous as a really negative behavior. But when you actually look at the terminology itself, it's basically he lived excessively. He chose those things that satisfies his cravings. Great point. You know, whenever we pursue things that satisfy our cravings. Carnal. Yeah, it's carnality. Paul talks about in Corinthians. You know, carnality looks to God as, yeah, that's outright rebellion. But the truth is, it does not have to be that deep, dark, negative stuff that that the older brother said. It could be that poor um, investment decision. It could be the stupid need to get all the things that the rest of the world has simply so I can look like them. But he chose a pattern that was uniquely different than what he was raised with. So it was excessive. Great point. And it was ridiculous. Yeah. We just like the word riotous because that gives us a sense of comfort that, well, I am never that yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're I, not I make, that bad. I make legitimate decisions. Yeah. They just read, led me down a decision, a road that, well, I couldn't help but going down there. Well, you got a different story when you look at the terminology that the yeah. word of God relates. For I sure. love that point. Well, and I think one of the things, this is not going to get into Arminianism versus Calvinism or anything like that, but the reality is that God will let us go down whatever road we choose to go down. And you made that point on Sunday, that that's one of the most beautiful things about God, and it's also one of the scary things, right? Yeah. Scary is the wrong word, but you know what I'm saying. It's, it's, sure. That's a big deal. The fact that the younger son, my, if it's me, and I, I'm not God, thank God, right? Because the son learned something in this, and there was a whole pathway that was, that was a good thing, right, in the end. But I would sit there and tell my son, you're not getting your inheritance right now, right? And, and so there's this picture of life that many times we blame God for things because, well, he was in control the whole time, and he gave me whatever. Maybe you've never done that. But, but the idea behind it is God in his graciousness and his love and his mercy in all that he is, he allows us to make those decisions. He's right. not a bully. He's not a puppet. His, al- his allowance is not his condoning. 100%. And um, 
you know, I, I, I think God is the ultimate parent and the ultimate loving parent. I, 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 I can't imagine that maybe the dad, um, you know, chatting with his son, we just don't have record of it, but you'd like to think that the dad maybe queried him a bit and go, you know, why, why do you want to do this or yeah. whatever, you know, to you just think? put it in a real, in a real deal. Cause dad would also, the instant he asked for his inheritance, dad would have known instantly he wants to leave this family. Right. Ooh. And, you know, God in his graciousness with us, when we set out on a carnal way, whatever that may be, I can't help but, you know, other family members, you know, come along and it's like, are you sure you want to do that? But, but at the end of the day, it's the greatest gift. It's what the Eastern Church has always taught, that the greatest gift that God gave mankind was the gift to choose. Yeah. Yep. And that is really a, it, it, it's both precious <laughs> yeah, and just scary. Oof, big deal. It, it is, it is, you know, and yeah. cause we've experienced that. We all have, you're, you're, you're maybe on the just beginning side of that, Rob, but Andy and I, uh, we, we have adult children, you know, that make decisions that sometimes we look at and. Whether you we can't spank them. Wh yeah, wherever we, <laughs> where, uh, whether or not we ever say anything or not. Sure. I'm sure we just have musings in our brain, and it's like, ooh, I don't know that I'd do that, but cool, go for it. Yeah, yeah that's um, heart heartbreaking in so many different realms. You know, the, oh. the tough layer you're throwing to the next, you, 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 within the church family, within you know, the side of faith, it's like when when people within the church family choose to go a different direction, and say, I'll, I'm, I'm getting out now. I'm leaving. Yeah, the, that. It's like yeah, it's a, the, the parental example you have in the biblical text is hands off, so to speak. Yeah. And, and that's hard when you want to No, you don't know what you're doing. You're making a bad decision. And here's here's a consequence that goes with that. That's it's just a sure deep seated yeah. issue. Yeah. Wow. Well, so now we're in this place. OK, I think a road is a great visual as well of repentance. Right. Yeah. It's a great visual of. Uh, every every road leads to Rome, I guess, is one of the statements you could make. But um, I would say another another way you could say it is um, there's a road close by that leads to the Father. Yep. I think one of the ways that you said it is there's a road somewhere around you that leads to the Father. And um, that's a cool image Well, to me. Well, the road that you're on is leading you away, so that's also the same road that leads yeah. you to. Great point. So you just turn around. Turn around. And, and repentance. That, you know, repentance is a, what, you've heard some people say, a, you know, 180 degree change of course or whatever. But yeah. Yeah, it's right, it, it's, it's right there. Cause yeah. Because th it's been a road that's leading you away from. The instant you turn around and go on that same road, go the other way, you're going to get closer. Along the way, maybe you've taken multiple roads, right? Mm -hmm. But along the way, um, man, that, that wooing heart of the father will yeah. will just continue to draw us back great point well in verse 20 says you know right after he came to himself and all of that it says so he set off and went to his father mm -hmm. right and so in other words there's this i could even say it this way and go back to raising your kids for a moment right he knew the way home he knew mm -hmm. how to get back mm -hmm. he knew where his father was he knew that if he turned around and walked backwards he was going to go back to his father so then that leads where you know, we don't need to spend any time on it. But when it when it came to himself, so what was he before he came to himself? He not wasn't himself. He wasn't himself. Yeah, that's not the real you. That's you know, and, and and I think I think you could make that a little bit more even existential. That I don't think we can be truly human. Oh boy, that sounds really philosophical. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can be truly human until humans are in line with their creator. That's love the, that. That's the only way i love that we weren't we weren't created set down on you know set down on earth so to speak by our creator and then just go okay go have fun we 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 really only are able to be fully human in all of its potential mm -hmm. when we are on the road to the father that's good that, that's the that's the only way matthew chapter 7 says narrow is i'll paraphrase it narrow is the road that leads to life, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the world's road is wide. There's a lot of people on it, lots of things happening out there. But 
he is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way to become fully who God's created you to be is through Jesus. We yeah. believe that, right? Sure. And so we see in verse 20, so he, he set off and went to his father. And one of the points that you made that I think is a, a great point is uh, it's way, it's easier to be stirred than moved. Than how, many, how many times have we felt the nudge from the Holy Spirit to do something and we don't, or felt yeah, the we'll nudge feel, from the Spirit of God to change. We'll and, feel mushy about it for a while. Yep. Boy, I need to do that. And Great then, worship and service. Then, Woo, and service then we walk happens, out the door. And then we go out the door, and then we go eat, or something happens for the day, and then we realize that we were definitely stirred. Yeah, Something moved in our heart. Um, but to be changed is a different ballgame. There's something I love about this kid, by the way. Yeah. Um, this 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 kid was a decisive kid, right? He he made a decision. Okay, it, was, it ended up being a wacky decision, but he made the decision, followed through with it, traveled to a different country. You know, went away to a far away land, which that just tells you right there that he didn't end up there by happenstance. He, yeah. He went. That that's a that's a giveaway that there yeah. was a there was a purposeful effort. I'm going down this road. Yeah. That's why I I, I don't think that uh, you remember the 1972. You weren't even born in, but I do not remember that. <clears throat> 1972. <laughs> when were you born, Andy? 67. 67. Did you remember this? Yeah, I was five. So I remember. Yeah, the clear. 1972 Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it. Yeah. No, no, no. Sin, sin is never that. Sin's a choice. Always. It's yeah. always a choice. It may be a split second choice, but it's always a choice. We just don't fall into it, right? Anyhow, he went away, but then what I just love is, is, is I just love the, I, I can almost just see this kid, you know, sitting, sitting in a, in a, probably some sort of a corral. I mean, we've raised pigs before, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> I get the smell, the whole nine yards. And, and sitting there and just musing and going, wow, what in the, what in the how stink, did I get how here? did I end up here? And, and my, my dad's servants right now are living way better off than I, way wow. Then, so then when he come to himself, I, again, this kid was decisive. This kid got up, made the decision, went home. And, and, and I like to think I'll take what, I'll take whatever's coming to me. Do you know what I mean? I'll, yeah. I'll take what I love it. I'll take whatever discipline my father may may. I'll do whatever, but you know what? I'm making the right decision. I say it this way: it's there's never a wrong time to make a right decision. Ever. I love that. And so he he did, and and he got up and marched back home. I just think, I think he's a good kid. I, I I like this kid. I love that, and I think you you said something about every you know sin is is you're making a decision, you're making a choice. Repentance is the same thing. Exactly. So it's the same thing in the opposite direction. We make a decision, and I think that there's something to be said about even go back to identity for a second. There was something in that kid that he had learned that idea of making a decision. I can make a decision to sin. Here's, here's death. Here's life. Choose, right? It's set before you. And uh, he chose to do something, and then he did it. And I think every, every uh, thing that we're going to do, every road or path that we're going to take, it starts with a decision. And mm -hmm. I think that's a really important thing to look at. So that decision of, I, I want to practice being quick to repent. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's a practice that we could have. Yeah. And I, it seems like you don't know much more about this kid than what's written. No, but as you read it, he came to himself and said, I got to get back home. Came to himself and when he figured it out, he made a decision and he started going home. Well, I also like the idea that he, one, he understood he was in a famine. His land had a famine. Two, he understood that regardless of the famine that's going on here, my dad is more than capable of providing for all his servants. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to go there. So he knew there was something about the quality and character of his dad to live above the economic environment that was going on, and he wanted to get back there. Yeah. I think the, the, the fact of him knowing his father in a very intimate way speaks volumes about, you know, I may not know who I am. I may want to go up to a mountain and discover myself, but somewhere along the way, I'm going to discover that the God of the universe loves me, and he's going to take care of me through thick and thin. Yeah. I love that. And it's in the exact same verse right after yeah. that. He turns around and he starts going home. And the next sentence says, and his father sees him from afar off. Yeah. So he sees him coming. And so there is that idea, too, of identity. Our identity is found in a good father. 
And there's many people that believe that, uh, man, I've done too many bad things. I've gone too far. I've done whatever. I've, I've been with the pigs. I've been with the prostitutes. I've done whatever, right? And all of a sudden, we start to believe the lie of the enemy that says that our father doesn't love us. He doesn't care about us. He's, he's already released us from the family. There's no coming back from this one. And yeah. that's a great point to make. I made it. Yeah, I'm, the decision I made now, this one's done it for me. There's no re- deal. But talk about repentance for a little bit because cause in the picture, right, the, the father sees the son a long way off. And obviously the son saw the father. Mm-hmm. Now all of a sudden the father's running, which, which, by the way, is just another cultural deal. This dad would have been wearing a long robe mm-hmm. and it was never customary ever for a dad to run with a long robe in, in this time frame ever. Sure. So you got to get a picture of that. I mean, I, I, I for, for me, I, I just see the joy of this dad, this literally picking up his robes and hanging around it. here and then taking off I because that, that, that was not, that was not culturally even acceptable, mm. uh, in, in that long robe and in his stature as, as the, the head guy, so to speak, for him to do that, he went against a bunch of norms. And I just mm. then, but then here's what's, here's what could have happened is, uh, the, the kid could have got back, dad hugs him, you know, blah, 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 blah. And the kid could have taken that. Well, dad knows I'm sorry, but instead repentance is naming what you did wrong and giving voice to it. And he, and, and so I can kind of see the picture once, you know, I, I, I see kind of a, a sappy Hollywood version of it, you know, where dad picks him up, they twirl, slow mo, <laughs> you know, right. yeah, slow motion or whatever. But regardless, the, 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 I, I just love this kid. I really do. This, this kid did repentance, right? It's like, okay, all of that, you know, I can, I can hear dad crying, laughing, whatever, I can hear son say, man, dad, it's good to see you or whatever. But then the, the kid named his sin. And, and I, I think that is, that's part of repentance. I think sometimes if we're not careful, we'll think that God is so loving, so caring, so gracious. Well, he knows my heart. He knows I'm sorry I did that. I want to encourage you. Real repentance is naming it. Because I think it's, so does God know if we're repentant or not? He does. But we need to know. We need to know that, if I could say it this way, we, we need to be, I'll, I'll put it in our gender, we need to be man enough to own it and say, God, I am really sorry. And then if that's against somebody else, we need to do the same thing and say, listen, what I did, and I, I think it's important, it may sound silly, but, but, we just got to give vocalization to it to say, man, I screwed up. I sinned. You know, he said, dad, I not only sinned against heaven, but I sinned against you. I am so sorry. I think that's powerful. I agree. It's powerful. Yeah. Well, and you made another point too on Sunday that I thought was really good. Um, Our choices don't just affect us. They weren't, we don't live in a vacuum is what you said. They, They affect everyone around us. And there is a difference between repentance and restoration, right? And there's Mm -hmm. a difference Mm -hmm. between, uh, in other words, we can repent and and then there still has to be some sort of restoration that takes place, if you will. And um, we see that in this story. It's a beautiful story. And um, I was with a friend just the other day. We were talking about repentance and they're from a liturgical background. And I learned something that I did not know about, but the sign of peace that's given in the middle of service, you know, it's not just a, for us, we were done with worship and we say, go greet someone around you, right? Mm-hmm. But that sign of peace. We need to start saying, greet one another with a holy kiss. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> now, this is where our conversation went that I thought was really interesting. Now, there's a, there's a difference between, okay, you're back in the family and now I'm going to accept you back into the family. And that sign of peace, it, back in the day, it was a kiss. It was a kiss of, of peace. And that idea behind it was, um, we're about to go into communion. We're mm-hmm. about to go into yep. the Eucharist. Yep. And not only have we repented before God, but now there's this that's going on. And I yep. think that's a really important part of this process yeah, that, that we... You know, 
sort of a different topic, but historically that that repentance part of leading up to celebrating communion or the Eucharist yeah. is is oh it's it's crucial. Right. Um, so that so that we as you know the children of God and and the family of God that we that we not me that we approach the communion table yeah clear sins removed yeah repentance has been asked for forgiveness have been given okay now we the people of God can celebrate communion together and but only. Only after that that's happened. Yeah. That's important. Well, and Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you have aught with someone, you go figure that out before you go make a sacrifice. Yeah, for sure. So, and then here's the, that's Old Testament, right? Well, New Testament, Old Testament crossing over. Now we're in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, we, I think that only is said, right? Um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's what Jesus taught us to pray. Yeah. And I so see that in the So much of the time, story. though, that I've seen, we've all been in ministry long enough that we've seen seen people try to live like they've repented but if i i i think there has to be a voice given to it mm. to say okay i've done this it was wrong i'm sorry will you forgive me and then let's live out our repentance but i think sometimes we miss that component and we just kind of we just kind of settled back in and flowing back in again when really there was a there was a, a, at least momentary there was a momentary break in right. fellowship yep. that I just, I just think let's let's you know part of this story that I didn't spend any time on uh, is that that I think I think there's there's better ways to do repentance I'll Love say that. it that way that Let's give full voice. Let's give full voice. Let's own it, man up. And that's why I love this kid. I, yeah. I just I just think, what a great kid. Well, and there's two parts to forgiveness and repentance, right? There's repentance and then there's forgiveness. And I, what we see in this picture here is we see a big brother who his job was forgiveness. His job was the walking it out. Whether he believed his brother was going to go off again or anything. Sure. I mean, this is fresh. You have to believe his brother's been gone for quite a while. And I've been the big brother before in that situation where it's like, yeah, we'll see big guy. We'll see if your repentance is right or not. Yeah. And so w knowing where we are in the story, I think again, is really helpful to recognize, like, could I be the big brother that's waiting for Andy to just, just mess up again? Right. How often does that take place in a, in a local body of believers? You've got You've got, if, if the body is a healthy body of believers, you got puppies. Puppies poop and mess and pee and do everything wrong. Inside. That was in our hall. <laughs> yeah. 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 Really. yeah. yeah. You got that all the way up to the stately, prudent, mm -hmm. wise person that's walked with God. Oh, I would never have walked away yeah. like that. Yeah. And so this, this is a, th th this story has so many levels for me it does. That, about church life. Um, that's so powerful. I mean, we've, 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 we've watched the, the young person be it age or be it in God. We've watched the young person, maybe when we had testimony services or whatever, we watched the young person make their declarations about this, that, or the other. But then the older guy, the older lady are sitting there going, yeah, we'll see. Yep. And then sure enough, the kid made, you know, or the, the person that's young in the Lord made some stupid decisions and then came back and apologized or whatever. And, you know, I, I call it the elder brother syndrome in every church has elder brothers that are just like this. Yep. Um, and they shouldn't be. They've, they've got, it's, it's like, because, okay, so yeah, this, this guy just happened to not make decisions that anybody else could see that were taking him down the wrong road. Yeah. But for sure he wasn't perfect. And, yep. and, and the giveaway that he wasn't perfect is his reaction. I mean, that's the dead giveaway. It's like, oops, okay. Yeah. You might have been until right now, and now you flunked yeah. big time. And, and we, we, we see that in our churches. And so I, I encourage every believer out there, 
if you've been born again for a long time and you would consider yourself seasoned in the faith, always guard against an elder brother syndrome. Never, I, never allow yourself to become that judgmental and mm-hmm. that whatever. It's like, ooh, that's a dangerous place to be. I think, I think spiritual pride, Jesus points out multiple times through Scripture that it's one of the ugliest things we can do. But I, I can't point to you guys in this. I can only say for me, I've been there. I've done that. So it'd be very easy for me to be like, I've never gone off and slept with a prostitute. I've never gone off and done these things. Sure. But I think there's the pointing to the, the spiritual pride side of the, prod, the prodigal son's big brother, that he was the one Jesus was talking about in a way that says, if you've ever even thought about, then you've done. Yeah. And that's important for all of us to recognize. So we're in the season of Lent, right? This is, where are we in this story? Who am I in this story? Have sure. I been the older brother? Have I have I been that judgmental guy um, against those that are off sinning, but I'm sinning in that way right now? Yeah, either off sinning, or I would even say in reality, or not just living and doing it the way I would do it. Yeah, that's probably true. You know, that's there's there's you there's there's a difference there. I mean, yeah, off sinning that's pretty easy to judge, but at the same time, it's like there's more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah. And, you know, piety, piety so often produces pride, but piety is to produce humility, you know. And mm-hmm. so I, I think for me, you know, I've been in the body of Christ for a long time, and I've been a Christian for a long time, and I, I, I refuse to be the elder brother. I just refuse to, I refuse to see people even in their failure and, and, not only not applaud it, but maybe have the thought, well, I knew that was going to happen. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's an ugly place to be. Yeah. Let, let's be, let's, let's, what I just love about the dad is the, the dad just goes, you know, shawl paraphrase. It's like, well, Bobby, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm sad you feel that way, but here's the deal. You, you could have had everything. You could have had all of this at any moment in given time. Yeah. All you had to do is ask for it, um, but you never did. Yeah. And, and that's a powerful one for me because sometimes in our walk with God, um, what is it? I think it's in James. It says you have not because you ask not. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we don't want to be that yappy little chihuahua dog that you know sits at God's <laughs> heels and always just ask him about everything. But there's something about that 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 stirs me to go, okay, what about my sonship in God is of stuff that's available to me that for whatever reason I never enter into. Great point. Um and that I mean that's really important and and I I I I, I the, the fresh air in this that, you know, I, I taught this story in Russia, in Moscow, Russia, when I, and I talked about it from a completely different perspective. I think there's a prophetic story to this. I, I think the church is the elder brother, the original church. I think the younger brother is the Protestants. <laughs> I, I'm serious. I'm already with you on that because, one. <laughs> be, because the, the way it reads out, the way it reads out yeah, is, wow. in, is incredible. And, and I taught it that way. Very interesting. Right there. In, in, um, I'm in Moscow, Russia. I'm a kid that had never set foot in an Orthodox church in my whole life. And I'm given a seminar on Orthodoxy in the heart of Orthodoxy. <laughs> and I talked about this. And so I talked about it from my Protestant evangelical brothers. It's like, okay, have we missed it? Yeah. And I say we have. We've we've thrown a lot of the baby out with the bathwater. Mm-hmm. But I also then I pointed to the Orthodox. I go, and you've missed it. You you've missed it. So some of these truths, yeah, that this kid got from his dad, you've had them all along. You just yeah. didn't operate in them. And and you know I'm I'm a little bit feisty. I said, so don't put that on us. That's on you. The dad when he his if there was a rebuke in this story the rebuke was to the elder brother by the dad and that that basically said listen you could have had this all along mm-hmm. and and but you didn't yeah and so so then that became a discussion among us among us 
Protestant evangelicals and some of the Orthodox people there. It's like, okay, so so where are we in that story? Great point. And it became an incredible debate. I uh, wholeheartedly agree with your assessment of that. I think there's additional information there that just really is haunting. To me, I, I would reference this second-handed faith walk. You know, the brother's out in the field. He comes in and he meets one of his servants. And then you remember, the servant tells him the servant side of the story. He doesn't have the, in, the intimate knowledge. When the son hears that, he doesn't even go into the house. He right. doesn't even go into the house where the party is. Dad has to come all the way out and find his son and talk to him. And, and the one See, thing why that... Why is we, your nose bent out of joint? Yeah, what's, what's, what's your problem? Why won't you come in and have a party with us? Enjoy what yeah, God's yeah. brought back together. And I think there's a lot of people in faith, they watch what goes on in the church with a critical mind rather than engaging personally yeah. and seeing how lives are being changed, yep. what the Holy Spirit's doing, how the Word of God is changing Love hearts it. and lives. It's like, no, it's easier for me to be on the outside and be critical because I'm happy here with the criticism that I can level from a safe zone. So you say I can't I can't judge yeah. football playing on, on television exactly. by sitting in my armchair. I can be the armchair quarterback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, yeah, the big change ooh. is when you actually have to be out there on the field and participate or be yeah. the ref or be the player, suddenly now the game comes to life and you can understand a way that you never had to, had to before. And I think there's a lot of believers as well who look at faith from that same perspective. Yeah, I've gone down the road, but nothing's changed me. I'm still the same old person I ever used to be. Yeah. But then they begin seeing that there's changes elsewhere, but it doesn't look like what I think it should be. Good. And it really yeah, and that, creates a that, big discussion. That elder brother introduced information that there's no no yeah. there's no way that he would have known. No way. And and I see that in countries of where maybe there's a predominant. You know, I see it in. I've spent 25 years in Bulgaria, and when I can sit and speak with an Orthodox priest, he'll talk about us Protestants, and it's like, mm, I don't know where you got that. But that's not. That's wrong. Right? That's not true. Yeah. Here's what's the truth. Yeah. And then it becomes, you know, then it becomes on a real level. It's like then they're faced with, it. ooh, really? Yeah. And and this brother, this this brother, you know, went went off half cocked about his idea of what his brother was, who he was, where the, you know, whatever. Uh. It's like the truth is, is this is a family, and it's an imperfect family. It was, mm. you know, this family. The the one that may may be not imperfect is the dad, but the children are flawed. <laughs> Absolutely, you know the the, yeah. the the younger son's flawed for his deal, the elder brother's flawed for his deal. So that all yeah. all that just says is, gosh, we as human beings can goof this thing up. You know, there's a so particular easy. verse that I love. I was going through as I was looking at this as we were preparing for today, and I just thought, you know, the younger brother found himself at the, at the trough, looking at the food, thinking, you know, there's got to be something better. No one's bringing me anything. And there's a verse that jumps up from uh, Psalm chapter 142, verse number four. It basically says something to the effect that I looked to my right hand, I looked to my left. There was no one that cared for my soul. And I think along the way that Christ also knew the two types of sons that he's dealing with here. And he understood that a son recognized that his father's love could never be challenged, could never be taken away, and he cared for his own soul, and that's something that drew him back. And I think yep. that's a, a tremendous story of redemption that we see in that, in that story. It mm -hmm. is. It's the classic story of redemption, where the yeah. enemy would love us to believe that, uh-oh, if I get back on this road and start heading back towards God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet a buzzsaw, or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. I, and I, it's just the lie, but the 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 clearest wow. and the most beautiful picture is this, because that's that's the same picture that Jesus talked about when he challenged the Pharisees. And he said, when there's one lost sheep, yeah, you know, it's the same picture. Go yeah. get it. That 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 it's the father. It's the father that's the proactive one and has been proactive all along. And then once our action, you know, points us back home. I can tell you what. Oh, you know, I can imagine after this, I can imagine this father and son, this younger son probably had a great conversation. It's like, dude, I, I'm sure, you know, if the story continued, mm. uh, that there would just be natural stuff. It's like, dad, I don't know whatever in the world got into me. I am so sorry, dad. And, you know, yeah. and I'm, I'm sure there was stuff. And, and there maybe even been, you know, the, a result that we don't read, but culturally it would be true, 
It's like, okay, but I want you, because you're the younger one, I want you to know you got what you got. It's, yeah. It's your, your inheritance sure. now is done. You're a part of this family, you're, you, 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 but, but you yeah. got your inheritance. I mean, it's in there. You, you go back and, and look Old Testament. You know, it's like the, what was it, Esau and Jacob. It's like it was already given. <laughs> Junk. Yeah. So, so yeah, I don't know. I, d- I just love this story. I, I just think it's a great story. I think it's a great story. And I think one thing you've woven into this whole movement from day one is the, is the point of perspective. And perspective's important. How are we looking at it? I love that we just went there as well from the Protestant. And, and I think we, even within Protestantism, think about we could be the older brother as the yeah, yeah, newer yeah. church that's looking down the road at the liturgical church and... And our glasses that are on our nose looking down at them or, or they're looking down at us or whomever, right? And I think that perspective that says, hey, we're in the family of God together. We look yeah. different. We do things different. Sure. But man, this is the family of God. And that should turn us from, am I the older brother in this that's missing something? Am I missing the rejoicing? Am I missing? It's one of the things that you talked about. Perspective should cause us to rejoice and to celebrate with each other celebrate that we serve the risen king i mean come on what else no. what what better is there to celebrate than that and so this idea that perspective i think it just even in closing we're in lent and we're on a road of lent if you will and this can be a road that leads us to perspective or it could just be 40 days of not eating something denial denial getting down the road and i think we could, could just even, be 40 days of duty 40 days of duty. You know, without life in it. And I I think perspective can tell us something as we go down the road. I think this is a great picture. This this parable can get us to zoom out. And then maybe even to zoom in on certain parts of our life. To zoom in on, am I the younger brother? Am I what am I doing wrong here? Am I sure. the older brother where I'm being judgmental? Well, I think what I meant in my heart, and whether I communicated it well or not, probably is is up for grabs, but what I meant in my heart is this, in terms of this movement, is find out where you are. Is that where you should be? And then decide to make a change if, if that's in order. Good. And, and to just say, okay, here's where I'm at. Is this really where I want to be? Is this where I should be? And I, I believe those types of questions the Lord will readily let us know. You know, well, and, and, then a, and then to just go, okay, okay. So then we could kick ourselves and say, I can't believe down, I've been down this road for so long. It's like, whatever, you know, yeah. however you deal with that. But let's just quickly, when we realize, when we come to ourselves, it's like, oh, this isn't, this isn't good for you. Let's just quickly repent and um, get and back we, on the We may on not road. find ourselves in the same situation where we're so far down the road, but but right. every one of us are making little decisions that are causing us to maybe not walk the straight and the narrow yep. and to be right in line with the will of God. And I think we could all say that on a regular basis. We have to, we have to catch ourselves in that. And I'll quote you because I think this is great. Um, you said, let's have a default that when we find ourselves on the wrong road, that we immediately get back on the right road. Right. And I think that's the whole point of this. I think that leads us even on this season of Lent. We're, we're trying to create a default, a practice, a way of life that says, oh, I, I'm off the path a little bit. Let's get back on. Oh, I'm not walking towards God. I'm going to get back on. Oh, I don't look like Jesus. I'm going to get back on the path. And that constant checking ourselves, making sure we're your pilot. You know, if you're off just a little bit, you're not going to end up where you want to be. And this is a part, this is an opportunity for all of us. And I would just encourage you to take the opportunity, check ourselves, recognize, and then let's create a default. Let's create a foundation in our life that when we're not on the path we're supposed to be on, we get back on. We find ourselves in ourselves. We make a decision. Yep. We walk towards the Father. Yeah. And that, that default has a couple ingredients. The default is repent when we realize we failed and then get home and then regroup and go from there. You know what I mean? Good. Well, join us 
next week as well. We're going to be still in Lent. Look at that. We're getting closer to Easter, though. Excited about it. So join us next week here at the table. Guys, thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next week.